Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and remember, context is everything media network. Founder and CEO, John Michael. Reading a textbook, cover to cover. World history textbook. Context is everything media network. The ethics are all about setting and establishing context. That's why I'm reading a textbook cover to cover. So in order to learn about history, establish my historical context, and, uh, you know, you know, read about history. So what I'm going to do right now, in the spirit of context being everything, I'm going to read the notes from yesterday's reading now so that you can have context for today's reading, which is about Genghis Khan, ancient Mongolian and Ming empires. That's what I'm gonna do. And if you don't like it, well, you can leave. No, I'm joking, please stay and leave a coin in the comments below because that means it's a comment, it's a point. If you have something to say, please say something. I would love to respond. Um, but sometimes I'll give a thumbs up. I'll be right back. I gotta get my, my timer. I was supposed to have started this video like a half hour ago, but I dilly-dallied. I dilly-dallied and now we're here. And now we're here. After dilly dallying, now we're here. But it's a beautiful day. A beautiful day for acid rain. Hopefully not. But whatever. Okay. Chapter 13, section 1 was yesterday. Here's the review The Tang and Song dynasties in China. China experienced a period of division and turmoil after collapse of the Han dynasty in 220 AD. However, the country gradually, gradually improved its farming production and technology, and Buddhism spread while arts and learning continued. The Sui dynasty briefly reunited China, uh, but the Tang dynasty, which began in 618, was considered to have restored China to its earlier glory. So the Sui brought it back together after a fragmentation, but the Sui was short-lived. The Tang uh, Tang Taizong, uh, the first Tang emperor, was a brilliant general, government reformer, historian, and master of calligraphy. Later, Tang rulers expanded the empire by conquering territories deep into Central Asia and forcing neighboring lands to become tributary states, meaning that they had to pay tribute to the Tang dynasty, so like Taiwan and other neighboring countries. So they stayed sovereign, but they had to say, well, China is kind of our guy. We kind of are subject to them. And here's some money, China, every year or every so often, whatever. Uh, the Tang emperors also instituted a system of land reform, which strengthened the central government and increased government revenue. Under the Tang Dynasty, a system of canals encouraged internal trade and transportation. The Grand Canal, which linked the Huanghe and Yangtze rivers, uh, was the longest waterway ever dug by human labor, um, at its time at least. However, corruption, high taxes, drought, famine, and rebellion contributed to the downswing of the Tang Dynasty, and ultimately it fell in 907. So 618 to 907, the Tang Dynasty. The Song Dynasty, which began in 960, faced constant threats of invaders in the north and had smaller territory than the Tang. However, the Song Dynasty is considered to have marked a golden age due to improvements in irrigation methods that allowed for production of two rice crops per year, creating surpluses that allowed people to pursue commerce, learning, or the arts. The government also issued paper money to improve the trade market, leading to the prosperity of Chinese cities. China's Chinese society during this time was divided into two main social classes, the gentry and the peasantry. 
The gentry, or the wealthy landowning class, provided most of the scholar officials at court. Most Chinese were peasants who worked the land, living on what they produced. Peasants lived in small, largely self-sufficient villages that managed their own affairs, and disputes were resolved within the village or brought to the emperor, uh, emperor's county representative. But the ideal was that they would resolve the problems on their own. If they had to, they'd go to the government. Um, according to Confucian tradition, merchants had an even lower st social status than peasants because merchants made money off of people's labor. They did not labor in the sense of manual labor. But, yeah, that's the logic, the Confucian logic. The song custom of foot binding reinforced women's subordinate position, limiting their ability to walk and reinforcing the Confucian tradition that women should remain inside the home. Whew. Yikes. In arts and literature, the scholar gentry focused on the balance and harmony through the mastery of simple strokes and lines. Wide sweeping lines. Wide sweeping lines are aesthetically pleasing. I agree. Taoist tradition influenced painters who sought to capture the spiritual essence of the natural world. Buddhist themes dominated sculpture and influenced Chinese architecture. The Chinese perfected the skill of making porcelain, a shiny, hard pottery that was prized as the finest in the world. Developing this beautiful glaze to decorate vases, the Chinese earned the title of this art as Chinaware, or China, as we hear of it today. The greatest Tang poet was Li Bo, who wrote 2,000 poems celebrating the harmony with nature or lamenting the passage of time. A popular legend says that Li Bo drowned while he tried to embrace the reflection of the moon on the lake. Okay, that's chapter 13, section 1, and this is chapter 13, section 2 directly out of the textbook, which I'm going to read right now. Cover to cover. Well, it's like three pages. Setting the scene. The Mongols were tough, skilled warriors who lived in the saddle. They could travel for days at a time on their shaggy ponies, drinking mare's milk and eating only a few handfuls of grain. I eat a few handfuls of grain regularly. Uh, they were also considered the most skilled horse riders in the world. An observer described Mongol battle tactics. This is the description. They keep hovering about the enemy, discharging their arrows first from one side and then from the other. Their horses were so well broken in to quick changes of movement that upon a single given, they instantly turned in any direction, and by their rapid maneuvers, many victories have been obtained. That's Marco Polo, a description of the world. Why didn't they tell me that was Marco Polo at the first? They, they said a onlooker. Why didn't you say Marco Polo? About 1200... The Mongols burst out of Central Asia to conquer an empire stretching across Asia and Europe. In the process, they overran Song China and imposed Mongol rule on its people. We've talked about the Mongols a lot in this book so far. And this is the first chapter or section that's devoted to the Mongols. Building the Mongol Empire the Mongols were nomadic people who grazed their horses and sheep on steppes of, China, of central China. River Mongol clans spent much of their time wearing one, uh, warring with one another. In the early 1200s, however, a brilliant Mongol chieftain united these warring tribes. This chieftain took the name Genghis Khan, and as we've spoken of before, that translates to... Genghis Khan translates to World Emperor. World Emperor. Genghis Khan. Yep. Under his leadership, Mongol forces triumphantly conquered 
the vast empire that stretched from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe. Conquests, subheading, under building the Mongol Empire. Genghis Khan imposed strict military discipline, discipline and demanded absolute loyalty. His highly trained mobile armies had some type of had some of the most skilled horsemen in the world. Genghis Khan had a reputation of a reputation for fierceness. He could order a massacre of an entire city. Yet he also could be generous in rewarding the brave of a single fi- the bravery of a single fighter. Mongol armies conquered Asian steppe lands with some ease, but as they turned on China, they faced a problem of attacking walled cities. Chinese and Turkish military experts taught them to use cannons and other new weapons. The Mongols and Chinese launched missiles against each other uh, from metal tubes filled with gunpowder. This use of the cannon in warfare would soon spread westward to Europe. Genghis Khan did not live to complete the conquest of China. His heirs, however, continued to expand the Mongol Empire. For the next 150 years, they dominated much of Asia. Their furious assaults toppled empires and spread destruction from southern Russia through Muslim lands in the Middle East to China. In China, the Mongols devastated flourishing provinces of Sichuan and annihilated the, its great capital city of Chengdu. Mongol rule. Once conquest had complete, once conquest was complete, the Mongols were not oppressive rulers. They often allowed conquered people to live much as they had before, as long as they regularly paid tribute to the Mongols. Genghis Khan had set an example for his successors by ruling conquered lands with toleration and justice. Although Mongol warrior, the Mongol warrior had no use for the city life, he respected scholars, artists, and artisans. He listened to the ideas of Confucius, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and Zoroastrians. Zoroastrians? I've heard Zoroaster, but I don't know where I heard it. The Mongol peace. In the 1200s and 1300s, the son and grandson of Genghis Khan established peace and order within their domains. Today, many historians refer to this period as the Pax Mongolica, or Mongol peace, similar to the Pax Romana, Roman peace. Pax Mongolica. Political stability was set for economic growth. Under the protection of Mongols, who now controlled the Great Silk Road, trade flourished across Eurasia. According to a contemporary Mongol rule meant that people enjoyed such a peace that a man might have journeyed from one land of sunrise to the land of sunset with a golden platter upon his head without suffering the least violence from anyone. They're saying that somebody could wear gold, travel in the Mongolian Empire, and not be afraid of being robbed while they're wearing gold. Cultural exchange increased as foods, tools, inventions, and ideas spread along the protected trade routes. From China, the use of windmills and gunpowder moved westward into Europe. Techniques of paper making reached the Middle East, and crops of tr- and trees from the Middle East were carried into East Asia. China under Mongol rule. Although Genghis Khan had subdued northern China, the Mongolians needed nearly 70 more years to conquer the south. Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai, Kublai Khan, finally toppled the last Song Empire in 1279. From his capital at Kambulak, present-day Beijing, Kublai Khan ruled 
all of China as well as Korea, Tibet, and Vietnam. Government under Mongolian rule. Kublai Khan tried to prevent the Mongols from being absorbed into Chinese civilization as other conquerors of China had been. He decreed that only Mongols could serve in the military. He also reserved the highest government jobs for Mongols uh, or for other non-Chinese officials whom he employed. He still, because, uh, still, because there were too few Mongols to control so vast an empire, Kublai Khan allowed Chinese officials to continue to rule in the provinces. Under Mongol rule, an uneasy mix of Chinese and foreign ways developed. Kublai Khan adopted a Chinese name for the dynasty, the Yuan, and turned Kambulak into a Chinese walled city. At the time, he had Arab architects design his palace, and many rooms reflected Mongol steppe dwellings. Kublai Khan was a capable but demanding emperor. He built and extended the Grand Canal to his new capital, though a terrible cost in human lives. He also welcomed many foreigners to his court, including African Muslim world traveler Ibn Batuta, Batuta, Ibn Batuta, I-B-N, B-A-T-T-U-T-A, Ibn Batuta. Western visitors. Western visitors. The Italian merchant Marco Polo was one of many visitors to China during the Yuan Dynasty. Yuan Dynasty is when the Mongols ruled China. In, seven, in 1271, Polo left Venice with his father and uncle. He crossed Persia and Central Asia to China. During his stay in China, he spent 17 years in Kublai's service. He returned to Venice by sea after visiting Southeast Asia and India. In his writings, Marco Polo left a vivid account of the wealth and splendor of China. He described the royal palace of Kublai Khan, with its walls covered with gold and silver and decorated with pictures of dragons, birds, and horsemen, and various breeds of beasts and scenes of battle. Polo also described China's efficient royal mail service, with couriers riding swift ponies along the emperor, empire's well-kept roads. Furthermore, he reported that the city of Hangzhou was 10 or 12 times the size of Venice, one of Italy's richest cities. As you have said, as you've read, Marco Polo's book astonished readers in medieval Europe. In the next centuries, Marco Polo's reports sparked a European interest in the riches of Asia. Other contexts. Under contacts. As long as Mongol Empire prospered, contacts between Europe and Asia continued. The Mongols tolerated a variety of beliefs, and the Pope sent Christian priests to Beijing, while Muslims set up their own communities. Where am I? Communities. Meanwhile, some Chinese products moved towards Europe. They included gunpowder, porcelain, and playing cards. You know those see-through playing cards that you could buy at the store in 2009? Remember those? I still have some. Those playing cards that were see-through, remember? Those were pretty cool. The Ming restore Chinese rule. The Yuan dynasty, again, Mongol dynasty, declined after the death of Kublai Khan. 
Most Chinese despised the foreign Mongol rulers. Confucians, Confucian scholars retreated into their own world, seeing little to gain from the barbarians, heavy taxes, corruption, and natural disasters that led to frequent uprisings. Finally, Zhu Yuan Zhang, Zhu Yuan Zhang, a peasant leader, forged a rebellion army to topple the Mongols and pushed them back beyond the Great Wall. In 1368, he founded a new Chinese dynasty, which he called the Ming, meaning brilliant dynasty. The early Ming rulers sought to re uh, reassert Chinese greatness after years of foreign rule. The Ming restored a civil service system and Confucian learning again to become the road to success. The civil service exam began, uh, became more rigorous than ever. A board of censors watched over the bureaucracy, rooting out corruption and disloyalty. Well, it's always problematic when you have a centralized group that's meant to rule out corruption because what if the centralized governing body that's trying to rule out corruption is themselves corrupt? This is a conundrum, isn't it? And it's a conundrum that we all need to consider because if you don't consider it, I'm sorry, you're not thinking very hard. And I'm going to speak very fondly about you're not thinking very hard when things stop working very well for you because you really have to consider if a centralized power wants to take control and say that they're right about everything. And this goes for the Pope. This goes for government in general. If they have absolute rule and absolute power, all they have to do is be corrupted. All they have to do is have a reason to say something that is not for the greater good, whether it's money, whether it's power. And they will eventually start doing those corrupt things because somebody will eventually fold and succumb to the allure of power and money. And if you don't believe that, please reconsider. Please reconsider. Okay. So I say that because civil service exams became more rigorous than ever, and a board of censors watched over the bureaucracy, rooting out corruption and disloyalty. Board of censors, a little bit of a conundrum because they can be corrupt. If they're not, great. But eventually one of them will be because power finds its way, just like water. Corruption, too, in a system. It always happens. It's always happened, and it will continue to always happen, which is why we need to uh, be a little bit more discerning about who what our leadership does. And that is a wide-sweeping statement about everything and everyone. Economic revival. Economically, Ming China was immensely productive. The fertile, well-irrigated plains of eastern China supported a population of more than 100 million. What? That's a big number. In the Yangtze Valley, peasants produced huge rice crops. Better methods of fertilizing helped to improve farming. And in the 1500s, new crops reached China from the Americas, especially corn and sweet potatoes. Cities in China were home to many industries, including porcelain, paper, and tools. The Ming repaired an ex the extensive canal system that linked various regions and made it easier for new technologies to increase output for manufacturing. Better methods of printing, and for example, led to the production of a flood of books. Cultural flowering. Ming China also saw a revival of arts and literature. Ming artists developed their own styles of landscape paintings and created brilliant blue and white porcelain. Ming vases were among the most valuable and popular Chinese products exported to the West. So that white with blue designs is Ming inspired. Didn't realize that. But that is a emblematic form of China where Confucian scholars continued to produce classical poetry. At the same time, new forms of popular literature meant to be enjoyed by the common people began to emerge. Ming writers composed novels, including The Water Margin, 
about an outlaw gang that tries to end injustice by corrupt officials. Ming writers also produced the world's first detective story. Why am I reading about this? Performing arts developed a popular tradition of China opera combined with music, dance, and drama. China and the world. New heading. China and the world. Where are my sunglasses? Early Ming rulers proudly sent Chinese fleets into distant waters. The most extraordinary of these overseas ventures were the voyages of the Chinese admiral, Zhang He. The voyages of Zhang He. He. In 1405, Zhang He commanded the first seven expeditions his first seven expeditions. He departed at the head of a fleet of six, uh, 62 huge ships and hundreds of smaller ones, carrying a crew of more than 25,000 soldiers, sailors. The largest ship measured 400 feet long. The goal of each expedition was to promote trade and collect tribute from lesser powers across the Western Seas. Between 1405 and 1430, Zhang He, hey, <coughs> Zhang He explored the coasts of Southeast Asia and India and the entrances of the Red Sea and the Pacific Gulf. Persian Gulf, rather. Persian Gulf. He also dropped anchor and visited many ports in East Africa. In the wake of the expeditions, Chinese merchants settled in Southeast Asia and India, trading centers. The voyages also showed local rulers the power and strength of the Middle Kingdom. Many acknowledged the supremacy of the Chinese Empire because of the 62 ships and 25,000 sailors. Zhang He set up an engraved stone tablet listing the dates and places uh, and achievements of his voyage. The tablet proudly proclaimed that the Ming had unified seas and continents, even more than Han and Tang had done. Here's a quote from the man himself, saying he, The countries beyond the horizon and from the ends of the earth have all become subjects. We have crossed immense waters, spaces, and have seen huge waves like mountains rising sky high, and we have set eyes on barbarian regions far away, while our sails loftily unfurled. <laughs> like clouds, day and night continued their course, crossing those savage waves as if they were walking on a public highway, a public highway that the Mongols made safe according to the book. That's Zhang He quoted from the true dates of the Chinese maritime expeditions in the early 15th century. Turning inward, and this is the final section of the week, and I hope you have a good weekend, and I hope you enjoy, because it's a beautiful day and a beautiful life, and we can all find something fruitful in it. In 1433, the year Zhang He died, the Ming emperors sub sub suddenly banned the building of seagoing ships. Seagoing ships, why? Later, ships were more than two masts were sh forbidden. I don't understand. Zhang He's huge ships were retired and rotted away. Why? Why did China, with its advanced naval technology, turn its back on overseas exploration? That's what I'm asking. Historians are not sure. What? However, some speculate that the fleets were costly and did not produce any profits. Also, Confucian scholars at court had little interest in overseas ventures. To them, Chinese civilization was most successful in the world. They wanted to preserve its ancient traditions, which they saw as the source of stability. In fact, such rigid loyalty to tradition would eventually weaken China and once again leave it to pray uh, leave it prey to foreign domination.
left them vulnerable, them sticking to their roots. That could be a little bit of a, I don't know. I think that tradition is important, and I think that the demeaning of tradition is always a weak stance because tradition comes from ancient wisdom, and ancient wisdom should at least be considered rather than poo-pooed by a sixth grader who heard somebody say on TV that tradition's stupid. Maybe tradition is stupid, but at its core, if it lasted so long, it's definitely not. So it's worth considering for everyone. And if you're telling people, especially young people, that tradition is stupid, you're corrupting their minds because they don't have a foundation to build on if tradition is stupid. So please consider what you're saying for the youth. Dummies. You dummies, not the youth. The youth aren't dummies. But if we tell them tradition is dumb without giving them any context of why tradition happens in the first place, we're going to make them dummies. Fewer than 60 years after China halted overseas expeditions, the explorer Christopher Columbus would sail west from Spain in search of a sea route to Asia. As you will see, this voyage made Spain a more powerful and had dramatic impact on the entire world. We can only wonder how the course of history might have changed if the Chinese had continued explorations they had begun under the Ming. They're insinuating that China might have discovered America instead of Christopher Columbus, the Italian. I hope you have a good day. I hope you have a good weekend. I hope that we can see the value of tradition at the root core. Maybe not that we uh, use it ourselves for our whole lives, but that we at least strive to understand why ancient wisdom lasted so long before we poo-poo it, corrupting the minds of the youth. Have a good weekend. Love you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.